Hi, good morning, I'm Carolina. I'm Annalisa. And we'd like to welcome you to the fifth episode of The Real Place. Yes. The Real Place is a brand new podcast, first of its kind, global exclusive, and it's filmed entirely inside the Gemba Virtual Reality Virtual Workplace. For every episode, we send an Oculus Quest wireless VR headset to our guests, whatever they are in the world, and then me and Alisa put in our quest to jump into the virtual world to meet and interview them. And we only invite true experts, people who have really been there, done that, and have the scars to prove it. And the premise of the podcast is that each one of them gives us just one prediction for the future. Could be a prediction on how we're going to work, how a specific industry is going to change, or it could be very focused on one company, challenge, or even one individual. Either way, the aim is to go beyond buzzwords and to really get to grips with the changes in business that are coming our way. Yes, what we want to know is how those at the forefront of the world's top brands think and act, really peeling back the layers to understand how we can be doing things better to progress and create positive change. Thanks, Carolina. That brings us on to our guests. One of the most vibrant and passionate people we have ever met. Mm -hmm. June Sarpong, a British television broadcaster and presenter, and most recently, BBC's first director of creative diversity. June joined us to talk about what harnessing diversity really means and how we can all challenge racism. And just before we jump in, make sure to stick around until the end of the episode as we invite our guests to nominate a colleague, partner, or a rival to join us in The Real Place next time. So stay tuned for that and enjoy the episode. Super warm welcome to you, June. Genuinely excited to be here with you. It's your first time in The Real Place. And for all our first-time viewers, each episode we ask our guests to make one prediction for the future. It could be a prediction about how we're going to work, how a specific industry is going to change, or it could be focused on one company, one challenge, or even one individual. June, hey. we would love to know what your future prediction is your hope for a better tomorrow? Well, I think in terms of what my prediction will be, um, I really genuinely believe that we are in the middle of a big paradigm shift. And I think that if you look at all that's happening uh, around inequality and the sort of of uh, challenges that we're seeing to the patriarchy and systems that have been uh, so unfair for the majority of people actually in the world, I think that we are about to see something quite uh, monumental happen in terms of readdressing the balance. Now, what I also believe is it doesn't mean that we will have a reverse of what we've had before, where mm -hmm. one group will dominate another. No, I think we're mm -hmm. actually going to have some sort of equilibrium. Um, and I believe that in the way technology has disrupted the way we live, I mean, look at what we're doing right now. I mean, who would have known this would have been possible even five, ten years ago? I believe that equality is going to do the same, but, but for the better. Thank you. Thank that. you very Thank you. much for that. I think we're all hoping for, like Carolina, I don't know if you agree, we're all hoping for a fairer future, one with yes. more balance, definitely. Yeah. Which is better for everyone. Even, even, even those who have more right now, actually, a leveling up. Uh, in the end, is better for everyone in terms of having equal access to opportunity. And that means being able to fulfill your potential, whatever your potential is. That's not saying everybody's going to do the same thing. Of course not. But it means if there is something within somebody which at the moment will not be tapped uh, because of uh, some of the systems that are in place, we will have the opportunity to unleash that potential, which in the end will be better for us all. Well, it's interestingly, actually, the world we're in right now, if you've noticed, we actually all look the same. <laughs> and it's a yes. someone comes this decision that we don't want to differentiate people based on, you know, color characteristics. We're sort of le leveling the playing field here as well. So I guess it's like the technology for good, I suppose, in this case. <laughs> yes, but I do also think that 
I also think that in a way, Carolina, we don't want to go the, the, the extreme end of trying to say everybody is the same because we're not. And actually, that's the beauty. I mean, the wonderful thing of, of, of the three of us in person is the diversity, is uh, the different perspectives and the different lived experiences. And yes, how wonderful that we all look different. I mean, it just makes life that much more interesting. Um, so I think what we want is is in a way for it to just be okay to be whoever you are um, and for us to celebrate that in all its forms. So, yeah, I, I'm excited. Thank you. <laughs> As you know, June, each of our guests, you know, they make a personal nomination at the end of the episode. They choose this person because they really believe their voice is worth elevating. So our last guest, Trevor, that you know very well, <laughs> nominated yeah. you to be in the podcast, really introducing <laughs> you as charming, clever, incredibly accomplished woman. We're really oh, like to him. know, how did you two meet? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I've known Trevor Phillips for a very long time. I think now I'm aging myself, Carolina. Um, I think I've known him 20 years. Um, mm. I was fortunate enough to meet him at the start of my career. He was this very sort of eminent broadcaster and, and incredibly well-connected and influential. And he was just so kind and you know, almost took me under his wing as a sort of uh, younger sister, as it were. Um, and he's just always been somebody that I can sort of call on for advice. Um, and, and you know, and sometimes he doesn't get enough credit for the good that he has done. Um, and, and the fact that he was pushing forward change at a time where it certainly wasn't, you know, on the agenda like what it is now. So got a lot of love for Trevor Phillips. Do you think that kind of, that theory of birds of a feather seems to kind of flock together because it seems with each of our guests, that word kind and the connection is always that someone took someone else under their wing or, or kind mm. of reached out to them to kind of share their kind of their, their world with the other person. Do, do you think yeah. that's that itself? I think so. And I think, you know, it, it's also picking up on, on what Carolina was saying before in that even if on the surface people seem to be different, there's always that common thread, isn't there? Um, and it's mm -hmm. and it's how do you unleash that? How do you connect to that and be open enough to receive mm -hmm. it? Um, and so, yeah, you know, the great thing is people like Trevor and, and there are many others um, in our industry um, who've always been that to me. This leads on nicely to talking about your role, because it's nice mm. to have people within the industry, as you said, who are willing to, to lift you up. So you've recently accepted the role as Director of Creative Diversity for the BBC. Massive yeah. congratulations on such Thank a history-making role. <laughs> Being the first, you mean you are the first, brings a yeah. lot of opportunity to make your yeah. unique mark. So yeah. what do you want to bring to this role? Yeah, I think the lucky thing with being the first is you get to shape it, don't you? You get to define what it is. And, you know, I've been able to set up my division from scratch. Um, and within that, uh, lay out the strategy globally in terms of our content around um, diversity and inclusion and empowering our commissioners to be more inclusive um, and to think outside the box in terms of the kind of talent that they nurture and develop. My department doesn't actually make programs, um, but what we do is we work with all the program makers to, to help them find new storytellers. Um, so, yeah, it's been, it's been brilliant. And, you know, we've been able to, in a short space of time, uh, get a lot of things done. Um, but that's also because of the time. You know, I wonder if we, myself and my team, would have been able to have this kind of impact a few years ago. Probably not. I mean, our timing was was right uh, for for a, a department like this to exist within the BBC. Well, well, all, all the best to you and good luck. I know you're already, Thank sounds you. like you're already shaking things up. Yeah, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever had anyone in the place that uses the word darling and sweetheart as much as I do. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm obviously I'm used before I was still am you know I'm more I was on screen talent and that's what we do uh, so yeah it's completely uh, a new world uh, being in the executive suite I think all businesses need that June I think they need a bit mm. of that vivacity that kind of realness that authenticity and 
Yeah, yeah just warmth. Uh, so yeah. w- this is something, of course, you probably noticed. We have um, your new book. I think it's a good yeah. time for us to, to make I our love way. how you, yeah, I mean, I've <laughs> never been in a studio that's put up a whole, I mean, this is very impressive, I must say. <laughs> Can I have a real one of these, please? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shall you join us just, just on the edge here? The issue of diversity it's clearly yeah. important to you. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've spent the last four years researching, writing, and speaking yeah. about the benefits of diversity for society. You yeah. recently published your third book called The mm-hmm. Power of Privilege. Yes. How white people can challenge racism. And right. it's dedicated to anyone who has the desire and drive to do better. Why do you feel you needed to, to write this? You know, why now? So when my first book, Diversify, came out, uh, basically uh, I was traveling around the world um, uh, doing uh, uh, talks and um, uh, lectures. And the funny, and most of my audience, actually, you know, most of the places I went would be majority white audiences. And the thing that kept coming up again and again was uh, white people would come up to me, even though the Diversify was about diversity and inclusion in general. So I looked at everything from class to gender uh, to disability, um, LGBTQ plus issues, even age. Um, um, So I looked at this across the board. However, the thing that would come up again and again um, at the events would be white people coming up to me asking, you know, effectively how they could be better allies. And I remember going back to my publishers and saying, you know what, we need to do a book for white people. I'm like, this keeps not <laughs> happening. I'm like, you know, and also in my life, I, I tend to be a lot of white people's one black friend. And so those, my friends will then also be asking how they can be better allies. Um, and so, so basically, um, so I said to my publisher, I said, look, you know what? I really think there is a need for a book like this, but they were not convinced. However, I decided to write it anyway because I thought, and then actually then the the thing that really um, sort of inspired it was I was giving a lecture for a big uh, consulting firm um, and they had all of their sort of high level clients. Um, And um, I was talking about most of the issues in Diversify and there was a young couple, a wonderful, really lovely young couple. And I could tell the husband was a bit, uh, so once we were all at the dinner table, I could tell the husband was a bit uncomfortable. And having been in television for over 20 years, you get good at reading people. Mm -hmm. So I could sense his discomfort. And so I said to him, you know, am I wrong? Right, but you're not really comfortable with everything that's been said. And I said, and I'd love to get your perspective. So he felt confident enough and safe enough to open up to me. And he said, you know, the thing that's really tough about this diversity and inclusion conversation is as a white man, I wonder what the place is for me in it. Often Mm -hmm. I'm seen as the problem and Mm -hmm. not included in terms of the solutions. And he said, and He said two things that really stuck with me. He said, one, I'd like to know how we move from conversation, from accusation to conversation. Mm -hmm. And then two, he said, I want to not be made to feel that I'm on trial just because I'm a Mm -hmm. white man. And I thought, wow, this this is this is it. This is the issue, because if we don't bring those with the most agency on board with us, we're never going to have sustainable change. What we have to demonstrate is that there's a better way of doing things. And so it was just wonderful. And so he and I had a really good chat that night. And that was the thing that made me know for sure there was a need for this book. So I went back, started writing it. My publishers still weren't convinced. Um, and so they were like, do another book, which is how we ended up doing the women's book. Um, mm. And then George Floyd happened. And obviously yeah. the fallout uh, and and everything that that brought up for people. And, mm-hmm. and my publishers came to me and they said, remember that book? And I said, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> and they were like, um, I think now's the time. And so we, we, we added some more color events because obviously we could um and then it came out last october so yeah and it's 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 phenomenal the way it's been received you know the majority of the response has been incredible and even the criticism i've been really open to having that conversation and that debate because i think we need to allow for for all of the discussions to take place Mm -hmm. but importance of timing really it's everything (laughs) yeah it really is carly June, this is this book. Uh, it came by Amazon to my house. I'll tell you a very mm. quick story. Uh, it came Please, up, uh, just 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 last week, and my husband is white. Yeah. So 
This the right. How the lucky door, him huh? to be married to a wonderful, <laughs> gorgeous woman like you. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, we, we keep it spicy. So my husband, my husband is white, and when the book arrived, I could tell that you know he was looking at the book, kind of like, oh, what's that? And he's mm. very open-minded. He's he's very yeah. warm, very you know he he is. I mean, he wouldn't be married to me if if he wasn't open-minded. Yeah. But yeah. as you said, you know the discomfort, you know that 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 whole kind of maybe secret feeling of is this an accusatory kind yes. of thing yeah. on the yeah. on the table on the library yeah. table yeah. and I, and when i when i looked at your book i i loved when you brought up it's not about accusation it's about mm. having conversations and mm. i felt that your book was the way it was told it was great it was more of a call to action and yes. very very call to action 10 clear action points that anybody as yeah. you said who wants to just do better and be better can yeah. embrace yeah. and yeah i genuinely felt like it was a book that i would feel proud to share with my husband who oh, is white bless you. and that bless you. you know he could actually look at this and read and say look i can see ways practical ways how i can be an effective ally you yeah. know and how he can actually use his his power of privilege so yeah. thank you thank you very much oh my pleasure my pleasure thank you well, so speaking to you gina You know, it's so obvious that you just have to be fearless with what you do. <laughs> you know, if that means being able to ask those uncomfortable questions and being comfortable with that, I guess that's what you yeah. do. But does anything yeah. ever scare you at all? <laughs> well, technology, you know that, Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I'm well, like technology. Oh my goodness! <laughs> you know, like. I uh, as I was saying to you offline, you know, I'm not somebody that gets stressed out, but technology stresses me <laughs> out. You know, you know, it's like a second nature. You're moving, you're, you know. Well, you were your... both very patient with me, so thank you both for hanging on in there. <laughs> mentioned in one of your interviews that yeah. Oprah inspired you to get into the media world she did. realizing yeah. that you could earn a living by just talking to people i know who knew what right? does it actually <laughs> mean to be good with people is that your secret oh, weapon oh yeah you know it's funny i think what it means to be good with people is to actually like people um mm -hmm. it's rare for me to meet someone i don't like it's rare And for me mm -hmm. to meet someone, I can't find some sort of. I mean, not everyone, but the majority of people I meet, I can often find some sort of common ground and mm -hmm. find a way of sort of connecting. And and I really like people because also, you know, what? I always think people are having children and so on. You think, my goodness, that person means the world to somebody else. You know, mm -hmm. for that person's parents, that child is their everything. If that person has children that person is everything and so on and so on and i always try to see somebody from that perspective when i meet them that I, then and, and that it's also a miracle that they're here think about it you know for that sperm to have fertilized that egg it could have been a one in a million it's a one in a million chance if that in fact more than that uh that they mm -hmm. exist so that in itself means that you know there aren't many people i don't get on with i think that's beautiful i, I, I remember my mum used to say that too that everybody has a mummy you know yes everybody's got a mummy so once you come from that starting place as you said that common yeah. ground is clear totally and it yep. disarms people i suppose it's just a different way so that's yeah that's brilliant yeah totally. i guess you know putting a note to that how much do you think where you were actually born and raised impacted your identity do you think it's important oh, for everything to that yes very much so i was so lucky i was born in the east end of london in a very multicultural area a place called Walthamstow E17 I'm one of the best mm -hmm. areas there is if I do say so myself um and it was a very um interesting time in, in to be born there because you had uh local working class people like myself but then the area was becoming slowly gentrified so you had a lot of sort of middle class and upper middle class people that were moving in but it wasn't as if you'd had the working class flight which is often what happens with gentrification so you had a lovely mix of everyone and then you had all of the sort of immigrant populations which my parents belonged to 
Um, and then you had the sort of uh, the native white working class community and everybody just got along. So for me, that was all I knew growing up. I was so lucky that for my sort of formative years, that was mm -hmm. my experience. And when I went into the industry, my experience was something else. It didn't necessarily knock my confidence or my belief in myself or, or shake my identity because my identity had been so solidly developed by the community that I was lucky enough to grow up in. Identity is, is I love, this is a very special and a very, you know, personal um, topic. I mean, coming from the Caribbean, you know, we, we say everybody mix up, mix up, you know, is a, yeah. a melting pot, you know. <laughs> I love so, it. Where, where in know, the Caribbean are you from, Annalisa? So I was born in Jamaica, raised love in it. Trinidad and Tobago. And I ah. say I'm born in, and I'm li living and loving in London at the moment. Amazing. Gorgeous. <laughs> well, I love both pla all places. I love the three. So great. And I think you're from so. Yeah. Actually. Yes, living in, well, I live in Leighton Stone, which is part of Wadham Park. No, yeah. well, I started yeah. there. Oh, my God. Oh, well, you're, you're, so you understand then. <laughs> yeah, I love, I love East Side. I love, I just, yeah, I love it. It's just got a bit of edge, a bit of yeah. multiculturalism, and yeah, it's just easy. It's just great. Easy. It really is. It's yeah, easy. no, I, I grew up in Leighton Stone until I was 13, and then we moved to Wadham Stone. So, yeah, that is, that's my community. <laughs> so, this podcast, you probably realize by now, June, is really about connecting with people and mm. understanding what makes them, you know, successful, whether it's in business and yeah. life in general. And, you know, looking back, you know, what, what were some of your kind of life defining moments that you hold there? Well, I think, you know, I was lucky that my, um, like I said, my parents are, are Ghanaian. Um, and that's actually a very matriarchal society. So uh, women are encouraged uh, to have an opinion. Uh, women are equal players in the world of work. The majority of Ghanaian women work. The idea of the sort of, you know, the whole work-life balance stuff, there's none of that angst there because they've always worked. <laughs> of course we work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually what's, what's interesting is um, it actually per capita has the most number of female entrepreneurs anywhere in the world. And wow. over 50% of its GDP comes from the female market traders. Mm. So they are very sizable, um, uh, powerful force. Um, but mm. what I love about the culture, and I think as we move through figuring out what feminism is going to mean for equality, what feminism is going to mean in terms of relationships between men and women, um, not just in union as in personal relationships, but also in the workplace. I do think that some of the models that we see in these ancient West African traditions are really great templates for the West because there's none of this idea of, of, of demonizing men. There's a clear place for both and a clear place for both in their full power. And, you know, the reason why a society, and obviously I'm talking in, in cisgender terms and I'm talking in, in, in predominantly heterosexual terms, but, you know, I think this applies in masculine and feminine energy across the board. But the reason why we are uh, as obsessed with sort of quote unquote power couples as we are mm -hmm. is because we know something happens when you bring two people that are in their full power together mm -hmm. that is magnified and I think we need to get to a place where where we're much more comfortable with that because actually what you do is you elevate both there's a quote that I love by Margaret Mead um uh the the, the late great anthropologist Margaret Mead and what she says is every time we liberate a woman, we liberate a man. And, and that is so true that actually when you allow women to be all that they can be, men shouldn't be frightened of that. What it does is it actually is even more empowering for men. You know, Barack Obama would not be who he is if he did not have a wife that is in her full power. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. I mean, is there anything that you do at BBC or the organizations you were previously in to kind of encourage that? Because I suppose for our viewers. Of course, many things. You know, I think it's really important, uh, one, to look at what's happening in terms of leadership structures and where mm -hmm. you need to actually bring in um, uh, systems in place to sort of create a, a progression pipeline for diverse talent. These things mm -hmm. don't just happen. You have to design them. Um, I think often, you know, we hear about 
the imposter syndrome for women. We all suffer from it, myself included. So actually even just working with women and female colleagues to encourage them to, to, to think bigger and to encourage them to actually not be scared to step out of their comfort zone. Because often the company actually needs that. You know, the company needs that diversity of perspective. So, yeah, there's lots of things and there's lots of ways to do it. I guess read June's book to find out more. <laughs> yes, yes that, absolutely. either one, power of privilege or power of women, either one. <laughs> or even diversify when you, you start with everything. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the starter pack. You need the, you need all three yeah. so you have a solid base. <laughs> there you go. You're the most expensive person going. <laughs> How do you unwind when you're not busy conquering the world? I'm really good at relaxing, to be honest. I don't have a problem with that. Um, I love to sleep. I really enjoy sleeping. <laughs> I'm one of those people that can sleep anywhere. Like, I, I don't necessarily need to be uh, in a bed. I can sleep sat up on the train. I can sleep, I can sleep riding a bike. Um, I, can, I can just sleep. Um, so, yeah, so sleep, sleep, sleep. And uh, I like meditation, you know, I'm quite into sort of esoteric and mindfulness. And then also eating, you know, I love yeah. food. Food mm. is my passion. I choose my holidays based on the cuisine, you know. Same. I'm not interested in going anywhere with horrible food. So um, I really love food. Yeah. Eating, I like cooking as well. I'm a big cook. So cooking and eating Absolutely. is how I am one. Yeah. What's Yum. the top city you've visited for cuisine? Oh, do you know where was just off the charts? Uh, the Seychelles. My goodness. Wow. Because they are a mix of everything. So mm -hmm. you have the Asian influence, you have the African mm -hmm. influence. Uh, you have obviously the colonial influence uh, from all the sort of um, European settlers. So all of those cuisines are literally fused into one. I mean, it's just delicious. So, yeah. And I'm a big fan of also Ghanaian food, obviously, which I just think <laughs> is best. And uh, love uh, Brazilian food. Um, love, 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 love Brazilian food. Love, love, love um, Italian food as well. I mean, my God, yeah. I mean, Italian food, yeah, I could eat that every day. Yeah. <laughs> You're making me hungry. God. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, the last thing for us to do is a nomination, June, uh, which we yes. usually do uh, on that side over there. So just before we do the nomination, I'm, I'm, I'm quite a... A family person and I can sense that you are quite a, a warm loving person and, and you're very tied to your roots as well and mm. as you know come from the Caribbean uh, which is very yeah. influenced by African uh, heritage yes, and culture, culture of and course. it's very typical in our culture for the family especially mothers to boast about their children's achievements I was just curious, you know, what what is your mum most proud of? You know, when she thinks of her, her baby girl, June. Well, you know, the funny of? thing is, actually, I've got a funny story where that's concerned. So, um, w you know, African culture is very much about education, particularly if it's um, immigrants. Um, and so, you know, the whole point of my parents coming to the UK was so that we could get an education. And I was uh, able to get work experience or an internship for any of uh, the American listeners on, on the sh of the show, uh, an internship uh, at Kiss FM. And they basically offered me then after that a job. And so I decided not to go to university and to take the internship. And my parents were furious. And they had all of these family meetings with all these uncles and aunts that I'd never even met before in my life telling me how I was bringing shame on the family. And uh, my dad was the only one who stood by me and he said, OK, I'm going to give you a year. And if this nonsense doesn't work out, you're going to university. Anyway, the nonsense worked out. And within a year, I was on air and then you know, went on to TV, blah, blah, blah. And at the time, my mother was furious. I mean, she was so angry. And then when it all worked out and her friends were like, oh, I saw you on the TV. She was like, oh, yes, I know. I told her, follow her dreams. <laughs> <laughs> of course like, she did. Not quite. Like, yeah, it's not how I remember it. 
<laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, I think that's a beautiful memory. And I think that's a, a perfect way to, to segue into okay. final right. part of the interview. All right, let's go. So if you'd like to follow us too, just to the board yes. over there. Mm-hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, June, um, with our podcast, the thread is each person sort of, you know, picks up where the other left off, just as Trevor nominated you as, as his kind of personal recommendation for the person we must hear from. We'd love yeah. you to, to keep someone in mind that you know and that you really feel like his voice, her voice has to be amplified. So we'd love to know who that is. Ooh, let me have a think of who the voice needs to amplify. Oh, you know who I'm going to nominate? And I really hope he says yes, because he's amazing. <laughs> it is. Do I write it down? Yes. yes. If you just go closer to the board, you should actually be able to touch it. Yes, that's it. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to nominate Kwame Kweyama, mm-hmm. who is uh, the artistic director for the Young Vic Theatre, uh, an incredible Beautiful. man, uh, creative, poetic, um, and I think you'll get a great interview out of him. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed that he says yes, but I think he'd be brilliant. <laughs> We've got our fingers and toes crossed. This is yes, a wonderful yeah. recommendation. <laughs> Thank you, nomination. Thank you, June. No problem. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for your patience and for your courage to try this out. And I really hope, you know, your mind has been warm. It's not all that bad. <laughs> no, well, thank you. Thank you both so much for having me. It's actually a lot of fun. So I'm, I'm glad we were able to do it. Perfect. Oh, we, we were so, so proud, so humbled and privileged to meet you. Oh, and thank pleasure. you for sticking it out. <laughs> Likewise. Do we high five or something? Is that yeah, what fist bump. We fist bump well, in, yeah. in this room. Whoa, yeah, yeah, yeah. whoa, amazing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Woo-hoo. Well done, Woo-hoo. ladies. Well done. Yay. Brilliant. Bye. Yay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.